Aren't you thankful for Randy and our musicians here every week, leading us? Wonderful. And I, let me just give a shout out to uh, those who uh, serve every week up there behind the scenes, making sure that our live stream's going, that our screen is uh, what it needs to be, and the music or the, yes, the sound is working. Uh, nobody knows that they're up there until something goes wrong. And, uh, and then they're recognized. So we ought to recognize them when things are going right. And thank you for what you're doing up there. It makes a huge difference. So um, it is wonderful. Well, for uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been working uh, through a message called Built to Last. As Jesus clearly said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And today, uh, by uh, God's grace, we'll, we'll conclude that series uh, just considering how Jesus is building his church. It's very important to understand what he is doing so that we can participate with him in that because he uses us as uh, the instruments to build his church. Uh, we've talked about our mission. We've talked about our model. And today we're going to talk about the method, what that looks like. Our mission, as a reminder to you, is it's magnifying the greatness of God for the joy of multiplying disciples. In simple phrase, we're going to magnify God and we're going to multiply disciples. That's what it means to build his church. I'd mentioned a few weeks ago, what would that look like for us, a local congregation uh, in the Lynchburg area? It basically means that we've got uh, about 92,000 people that live within a five-mile radius of this location right here. That's a lot of people. And there are 155 churches uh, in, in a little beyond the five-mile radius, but 155 churches around here, but most of them aren't packed out. And uh, the statistics show us that only about 25% of our population are connected, involved with a local church. I mean, 75% of the 92,000 are not going anywhere this morning to worship God. They're not tuning in online. They're, they're not participating at all in the last six months or anything with the local church. So what would it mean for us to, uh, to magnify God and multiply disciples? I pray that we can reach, and this is what I said, 1% of our five-mile radius. And some of you thought that was a low number. And then, you know, if you did math, 92,000, that's 920 people being engaged in the mission of our church. Well, that would mean that we would have to triple or our, our more in size. But if every one of us would reach one person, and then train them how to reach another person, we begin to multiply. It is doable by the grace of God. The same Spirit of God who was in Acts chapter 1 that reached thousands in Peter's preaching days is the same Holy Spirit that's reaching people today for those who are willing and able to speak of the gospel and communicate uh, with those around us. I think it's possible, and I think it's, it's going to happen as we see God's glory shown through this place to impact our, our neighbors, our co-workers, and all. Well, that's our mission. Our model is, is Jesus Christ himself. Our model clarifies who we are following to accomplish our mission. And I spoke of last week that Jesus is the one we're to live like, uh, to love like, and to lead like. How did he live? He was a worshiper. How did he love? He loved in the community of, of people that he drew to himself. And he says, you will be known as my disciples by how you love one another that we are a common unity in Christ, a community of Christ, so therefore we're going to love one another. If we love each other well, when we take the gospel of love to the community, they go, wow, the way you love each other is how we desire to be loved, so that's very attractive to us. We'll hear the gospel, the love of God, and we see it manifest in the way you love one another. One of the reasons why some uh, do have no desire for the church is because they don't see a lot of love there. They see what you're against. They see how you divide. We, 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 they see churches all over America that, that shout at each other, but they don't talk to each other and love one another. They don't work through the issues of life. And so when the, the church follows Jesus' model and learns how to love one another, then they're in a position to lead others like Jesus. That we lead one another as we grow up in Christ, but we lead others to Jesus by how we live and how we love. And so that's our goal is that we're going to lead uh, as a servant, because that's how Jesus led, as a servant. So today we're going to be talking about the method. How does that look? Uh, there's no pulpit today, so I'm going to use the chairs behind me. Perhaps you notice we rearranged, we redecorated. Um, so uh, this is not a permanent uh, fixture, though if I get real comfortable in one of the chairs, I might make it a permanent, permanent fixture. Um, but before I go into the method, I, I, I want to throw another M word in. 
for those who just love alliteration and those who are irritated by it, I've got another M for you, all right? So we talked about the, 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 uh, the mission. We talked about the model. I'm going to throw in what the message is. This is a little shorter time period, and it says, what, what is our message that then we follow our method? All right, what was Jesus' message? Well, the message is the gospel. You know, you and I need the gospel to be saved. The gospel is what? Good news. What is the bad news? Is we're sinners. What is the good news is Jesus has stepped into our place, taken upon himself the sin that we are, not the sin, but the penalty of our sin, the, the, the wrath of God that we deserve, he took upon himself and he gave you his righteousness. All right, every one of us was born in sin. I hope that we all understand this. I hate when I see statistics say, you know, you know, 35% uh, of Christians don't believe they're sinners. I'm thinking you're not a, a Christian at that point. You don't understand what the, what, what's the problem here. That every one of us was born into sin. From our mother's womb, we were born in iniquity. Uh, Psalm 51. Just looking at that passage uh, yesterday. So we're born into sin. When we're born, then uh, we're manifest that sin out. We didn't become sinners. We were born sinners, separated from God because of the fall of Adam. So we are separated from, from God in the relationship with, with him. So what, what needs to happen? Uh, do we just need to be better? If we can clean ourselves up, maybe God will accept us? That's like you and I trying to jump across the Grand Canyon. It's impossible. All of us are, are, are in a position of sin, separation from God. So therefore, we need someone outside of ourselves to do something to help us come into the grace of God. So what does God do for us? He sends his son to take on human flesh, to die in, in the flesh, though he did not deserve death. He said, I will die in your place, taking on all the penalty of your sin, putting upon myself. I'll take it to the grave. I'll defeat it. I'll rise from the grave on the third day. And if you will trust me, I'll take your sin away from you and I'll give you holiness that you don't deserve. That is good news. Every one of us have the, pro the privilege of going to heaven if we trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is God. He is Lord. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus. It's not by how we clean ourselves up. It's not what church we attend. It is not, you know, well, what books you read or who you hang out with. It's only the relationship with Jesus that, that gives you salvation in eternal heaven, uh, eternal home in heaven. So let me simplify those words. Here's the message, how I write it, and I explain it to people. This is what I say. In a shortened version, I say the gospel is the good news of God rescuing restoring and releasing disciples to live, love, and lead like Jesus. It's very simple. He's going to rescue us, he's going to restore us, and he's going to release his disciples to live, love, and lead like Jesus. Here's an extended version of that. And I'll, I'll put this in print so people can get a hold of this later, because as I teach people the gospel, um, which, by the way, I don't know how you share the gospel. There are different ways, different methods of sharing the gospel. I typically make it as simple as I can, and I go to Romans 6.23. If I were to sit with somebody and only get to three minutes with them, I'll say, let's look at one verse just to see where you are and what God's doing for you. And I go to Romans 6.23. It's a one-verse evangelism. It talks about the wages of sin is death. That's where we are. But then there's this great contrast. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I walk people through that. I let them see it for themselves. I say, now what are you going to do with that? And either they're going to embrace the death that's to come or they embrace Jesus and the life that he gives. Because there's only two ways you're going to live. So here's the message in an extended version. I say it this way taking the very words I shared with you just a moment ago about rescuing, restoring, and releasing, I say the extended version is this. The gospel is the good news of God rescuing sinful and separated people. If he doesn't come after us, we're drowning in an ocean of sin from birth. And if someone doesn't throw out the lifeline and rescue us, we are doomed. And Jesus is the one who steps in as good news, and he rescues sinful and separated people. And then he restores them through forgiveness and adoption. Both of those are significant. Because, by the way, if you're separated from God, it's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to be brought into the family. He forgives you of your sin. And, and, and if I was, maybe I've already shared this. I can't recall. But if, if this is zero, some of you math people, if this is zero and this is the negative numbers on that, on that scale, all right, uh, you're down here in negative 10 in your sin, and he forgives you, he brings you to zero. 
good. You've been forgiven. All your sins have been wiped away. But he doesn't just forgive you. He adopts you and gives you his holiness, so now you're part of his family. He takes you all the way. He did it all for you. He forgives you, and then he adopts you, and you become a child of the king. That's an honored position. And so he's rescuing sinful and separated people. He's restoring them through forgiveness and adoption into his eternal family through repentant faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not what you do, it's what you give up. You repent, you change your mind, you change your directions. I just want to follow Jesus. And he takes you all the way from where you are to where he uh, places you. But then the, the third part of the, uh, the gospel that sometimes is left out, you think, well, that's it. I've become a child of the king. No, Jesus did not just uh, forgive you and adopt you so that you could sit on your padded potential and do nothing. When he rescued you, he says, yeah, I'm going to bring you not only into my family, I'm going to make you a part of my mission. So this is where releasing comes in. He releases them empowered by the Holy Spirit to live as a worshiper, to love as a community, and lead as a servant to multiply disciples. All right, that's an extended version. Let me give you a simple version of how Jesus said it. Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. The invitation to a relationship was the transformation in the life so that you'd go on mission to reach new people. The whole gospel in one clear sentence. The gospel is the good news that he's going to rescue you from where you are and save you. And then he's going to, to, to reform you. and He's going to restore you into proper way, forgiveness and adoption. Then he's going to release you and say, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit now. I want you to go get him. I want you to go share the same message. All three are a part of the good news that God is doing in us. Don't miss the message because if you don't know the message, you'll never, never understand the method. So let's move on to the method. Which, by the way, part of the, uh, you know, what I gave you just a few moments ago on the, um, uh, on the Christmas invitation card. Which, by the way, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and point it out. There's a hole in, the ho uh, in this floor here. And I'm standing all around it. And some of you up here can see it. He's about to fall into it. Let me just draw your attention. I'm not going to fall into it, but I'm, I might be tempted. All right. Um, so here it is. All right. So why did I give you an invitation card? So it is a tool you can use. It does not have the gospel on it. I, perhaps I should have put the gospel. But what it does say on there is, you know, we're having some troubles in our day. There's everybody in the world that recognizes that, that we're in some interesting days. And, and I even heard, uh, I won't even say their name, but they're, they're nationally known uh, scientists on television when the, the reporter was asking what Christmas would be like. And the guy even said, there won't be Christmas this year. I thought, what? <laughs> You know, I don't know what your Christmas is, but mine is worshiping Jesus, and I do that every day. There is Christmas this year, and people need the hope. If you're watching television for hope, turn it off. You'll never find it. But you know where people can go for hope? The scriptures of God and the church, you should be proclaiming it. And so I've given you a tool to invite your neighbor to church right here, either online or in person. And I'm going to start next week and all the way through Christmas Eve. I want to focus on the hope the joy, the peace, and the love that we find in Jesus. There are people desperate for hope right now. They're desperate for love because of isolation. They're desperate for peace because of all the political stuff. They're desperate for joy because they're not hearing or, or experiencing joy at all. Why not invite them to the church here at West Lynchburg where they can hear all of these things and experience it? And if we're going to invite more people here, we need a little more room. One of the things I've been noticing, and this is just off the track for a second, but one of the things I've noticed here is that because we need to wear masks, that's, a, that's been advised to us, we need to have social distancing, we're struggling to find room for people in here. And part of it is because the limited amount of space that we have allowed you to sit in. There's tape on, on every other pew. And because I've seen people, they go up, well, we can't sit on that row, so let's all cram into one row together, multiple families, because we, we can't sit anywhere else. And so in our desire to be socially distanced, we're actually limiting your ability to do so. And so what I'm going to be doing this next week, and you can write me nasty emails if you'd like, I'm going to remove all the tape and stop being your, your kindergarten teacher telling you where you have to sit. I'm going to let you decide where you need to sit to be socially distanced and opening up more opportunities for people to spread out where they need to rather than trying to bunch up 12 families together on one row when you're violating the actual social distancing that we're trying to implement.
Why don't y'all do that when I say a good point about the gospel? I'm just... <laughs> so I'll move the tape. Now, I still want you to, you know, advise me, wear your mask, socially distance where you need to, but you just be an adult about the situation and love one another and invite more people to be a part of our worship on Sunday morning. All right? So what's our method? Let's get into the gospel of how that un unpacks. Behind me are four chairs. I was talking to Randy last week. What am I going to do? And where's the space and all? And, and so what I'm going to walk through for just a few moments is each of these four chairs. And these chairs are, is, are, are specific for reasons that I'm going to pull up a chair at a time for each point. Okay? I want you to understand the method of what we're trying to do. There are two, two lives that we leave, uh, lead. We are either uh, believers or unbelievers. Okay? Can you get me on the screen? Yeah. We're believers or unbelievers. There's one gospel and there's two tracks. You're either going to um, uh, die in your sin or you're going to live the life of Jesus that he, he enables you to do. Okay? But the finish line of the gospel is not, as I said, not that you just get converted. That's the starting line. Once you're saved, what did Jesus say he was going to do with this church? He's going to build it. Building takes blocks. It's not, hey, here's a block. Boop, it's built. There's a building of individuals within the church, but there's also a building in individual lives to grow up in the faith. And so I'm going to sit in this chair for a few moments. It's fairly comfortable. I stole it out of the library, and Kathy Duvall's not here, so I'm getting away with it. I'm sitting in a chair of an unbeliever. This is the first stage that every one of us find us, uh, ourselves in. Whether we were brought uh, to church from the cradle roll or we didn't get uh, uh, an introduction to the gospel until we were 50. We were all in a position of unsaved. Now, here's, here's the, the challenging thing about an unsaved person. They're sitting in their chair of comfort saying, you know, life's all right. Maybe I got some problems, but, you know, it's pretty comfortable. Why do I need Jesus? You keep saying Jesus loves me. Great. So does my grandma. You keep celebrating, you know, Jesus at Christmas and Easter. And, well, I, I like the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. What's the big difference? Because life gives them enough general grace. God is a good God that even if you're not a believer, he gives you general revelation and general comfort in life. Now, how many of you have ever sat in a beanbag chair? And you like them. Imagine me sitting in the same chair for 80 years. I'd go to work, come back, sit in the chair. How long will this beanbag chair truly last? I, there's a little misnomer, by the way. It says Big Joe on this. This is the smallest little chair I've seen. It's not a Big Joe. It's a Little Joe. Um, but the problem with a beanbag chair, it's great for maybe a year or two. But you know what happens to the little things underneath it? They begin to crunch. And eventually, I've had beanbag chairs that after a year or two, you're sitting on the ground. There is no more fluff in there. And that is life for an unbeliever. They're trying to be cushioned, thinking, I'm all right, I don't need Jesus, but eventually it all goes away, and then they get stuck. What am I going to do? And I've seen people in their 20s do this. I've seen people, I've seen people in their 80s realizing there's a final exam, and I'm about to die, and I'm not ready to meet my maker. But eventually, all this foam, all this niceness that's holding them up now is going to be depleted, and they need the gospel. This is where you and I need to understand, are we in this chair? And if we're a believer in Christ, then what are we to do with the people in this chair? They're spiritually dead. They don't know it. They're, they're, you know, they're in a position that they just, uh, they don't see their need. Their eyes are blinded. Their heart is dark. And you're saying, well, just love Jesus and let's just be nice to them. Listen, they're separated from God because of their sin. And they don't know it. So there's some things that a believer needs to do. Well, first off, let me look at uh, uh, a couple of scriptures that uh, I'll mention to you. This is what we call engaging the spiritually lost. Some of them are even seekers, the Bible would say. But they're fairly me-focused. Jesus said to the people who sat in this chair, come and see. There's a go and tell aspect and there's a come and see aspect. But he used the words, come and see. In John chapter 1, verse 39, he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. And it just goes on as he's introducing and inviting people to follow him. Come and see. There's also in Matthew chapter 28, there's a go and tell. Go, therefore, and make disciples. 
So there's a come and see and there's a go and tell. Come and see what God is doing in the lives of those who follow. Go and tell of his greatness to other people. Engaging the spiritual loss means we need to run around a lot of people who don't know Jesus and engage them in a come and see and go and tell approach. What is the need of someone who sits in a comfortable position as a sinner? They need the gospel, the good news. Now, will some re reject it? Absolutely. You know, people love to reject you. What I say is let them do it. The more often you tell, the more often they may reject. But guess what? The seed is planted and God's word does not return void. Let them reject you. And don't let them reject you in your mind before you ever told them. I've often talk, talked to Christians and say, man, they really need to know the gospel. Have you told them? No, because I just don't think they'll accept it. Well, let them reject it or accept it. Don't just sit down in your padded potential and not do anything about it. Some of you will have people in your home this week who are rejecting the gospel. You pray for them, you love them, and you tell them anyway. The whole world is proud about how they're living and they're telling everybody else about it. And I'm thinking, why don't Christians talk about God like the world talks about their sin? They need the gospel. They need answers to their questions. As, as Peter says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. So prepare yourself so you can answer some of the questions. But don't be afraid that there's questions you can't answer because there will be. So... You don't know something, say, you know, I don't really know. I'm still growing in my faith. Let me find the answer and I'll come back to you. You don't have to ha be the Bible answer man on everything, but just be willing to engage and don't lift your voice up higher and, and try to shout at people. Just love them. You know what non-Christian people need? They need Christian friends, people who love them, even though you disagree. Because you're being around enough Christian people, guess what? They see the magnification of God in your life when you're living, loving, and leading like Jesus. There's a couple of ways I, I've said this in the past. There's the prayer, care, share approach. You better be praying for people and, and caring for them enough and then sharing the gospel. Some have said you need to intercede for or invest in and then invite to. One guy uh, recently I wrote, he, uh, uh, read, he said, I have a CPR approach. I cultivate, I plant, and I reap. Okay, that's great. However you want to say it. But you need to pray for, for people specifically. Pray for people specifically in your family, people you work with, and they're sitting in this chair of comfort and they're not desiring your gospel, but pray that God would open their hearts and minds and pray for the opportunity to share with them. This is a method that we're going to do. Pre uh, prepare yourself and pray. One of the things I'll do in 2021 that I did in, in Georgia, uh, I, I went with this national campaign called, Who's Your One? Challenging every believer to have at least one person that you're praying for daily to hear the gospel and be transformed by it. So who's your one? I had a one. I actually had about four or five ones, but I at least had a one. There was a guy who lived next door to us, George. He lived there uh, in the basement of, uh, of our neighbor, rented out a room, prayed for him all the time, and, and prayed for him daily, and, and looked for opportunities to share the gospel with him. Do that with a lot of people. I, we had one family come to church. The father did not come, so I prayed for the father every day. Who's your one? I'm thinking about different come and see things in 2021. Of course, you've had a lot of come and see and go and tell approaches, but you know, uh, Lord willing, 2021, we could have a fall festival or, or an Easter egg hunt, or, and certainly the Easter service. Have a come and see. Invite everybody to the Easter service, but don't wait till then, by the way. Uh, uh, invite them to the Christmas Eve service. Uh, perhaps we can have a VBS. That's a come and see. The whole community can be a part of. I'm going to look for community days, a Sunday where we can invite all the local teachers and just honor and celebrate them. Uh, let's invite the police officers and the, and the first responders, and let's just honor them in a community day where we're worshiping God, but we're thankful for those who are serving week in and week out with no thank yous. Let's have some times where we can have a come and see. Then we'll go, in, go and tell the door-to-door -door visits. How many of you have been a part of the street team? Yeah, there's a few of you. Now you're all a part of the street team. You've got an invitation card, and there's a whole bunch of them that you're going to pick up and take with you. Uh, how do we go and tell at T.C. Miller Elementary School events or other servant evangelism opportunities? Local, uh, go to the local park and give out water bottles to those who are thirsty. When we're not doing uh, things where we want them to do stuff for us, but we're just doing stuff for the community often. 
used to give out free carnations to on Mother's Day in the community or on, on uh, Valentine's Day. How do we just connect? And they say, hey, we're from West Lynchburg Baptist Church. Just wanted you to have this, this carnation. You need a donation? No, absolutely not. We just love Jesus and wanted to love you today and put a smile on it. Different ways we can connect to our community. Because if the Lord's gracious enough to them and to us, we're going to see somebody say, I want to move out of this chair and I want to become a believer. And then they move to this chair. How many of you have used a chair like this before? How many of you want to see me sit in it? <laughs> I don't think this is going to work. No, if I try to sit down, I think I'll get stuck. I uh, certainly couldn't get my legs in there. This, who do you use this for? You use this for infants and growing children. When somebody becomes a believer in Christ, they realize that they didn't have it all together. They're actually just a babe in Christ now. And guess what a baby needs? They need love. They need some sacrifice from others to serve them because they can do very little for themselves. Guess what they first learn to do when they're born? They learn to breathe. For a new child of God, you know, the breathing that we do is prayer. Then they go from an unbeliever to a believer. They're going to get attacked, and you need to teach them how to pray. They'll fumble through it and all, but teaching a new believer how to breathe the breath of God, to pray, is essential. And then, what, 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 they're growing a little bit. What do you teach them next? You teach them how to feed themselves. You feed them for a while, and that's good. Teach them some of the basics. And then they get to where I want to, you know, you give them a, a spoon, and they, you know, they miss their face, and they get it all over and all. But you teach them how to feed themselves. This is what we do with new believers. Teach them how to pray, read the Bible with them, teach them then how to read the Bible on their own so they're feeding themselves. Then they, they grow up a little bit, and they learn how to begin to walk. And this is walking in step with the Spirit, that they can do this. This is what, the, the, the method is, you need to understand where people are at so you can train them and teach them where they are. Too often it's like you go from spiritually dead to thinking they're going to all of a sudden be down here, totally mature. You know, and that's not how life works in the physical world, neither in the spiritual world. As you watch Jesus work with his disciples, he, he goes from a, a, a come and see to, and this is what I'm calling it here in a sense of establishing the new believer. He says, now just follow me. He didn't give the new disciples any responsibilities he just said follow me and they would watch what he did this is what infants do this is what children do they mimic what they see and so allowing spiritual infants spiritual children to be alongside you to watch what you do as you're living and loving and leading like jesus they begin to want to mimic those things and you teach them how to do so the first step uh, is engaging. The second step is establishing in their faith, teaching them the basics of life and letting them hang around you long enough to begin to learn. This is the milk of the word. You know what they need? They need to know their identity in Christ, a child of the king. They need to learn to breathe, to feed, to talk, to know God's testimony, to know the gospel well, and to share their testimony. A new believer can reach other non-believers, not because they have an enormous amount of knowledge of the word, but because they have, all I know is, uh, I was blind and now I see. And when a new believer just takes that simple message with the prayers that they're learning to pray, they can impact lives all around them. Then it moves to this kind of chair. This is the best one I could come up with. And I took this out of Pam's office. This is associated with workers. When you grow up a little bit, and perhaps you don't sit on a chair like this when you work, but this is, a, you know, you don't buy this because you wanted this in your living room. You do it because you've got some work to do. In the first chair, it's all about me. What's good for me? What's my truth? This one is still a little bit about me, but it's more like, ah, you know, and somebody, if I scream long, you know, loud enough, somebody's going to feed me. You know when you're growing up in Christ, being built up in the faith, when you move from being um, the focus of everyone else's attention to start saying, hey, how can I focus on some other people? Come from a consumer to a contributor. Okay, this is a worker. Jesus said uh, about this, is, and this is where we're equipping the growing worker. That's the, the point here. Uh, establishing the new believer, equipping the growing worker. Um, 
this is where, this is like a young adult, where they're, we focused, how can I work with people? This is where we're fishing for people. This is where we're equipping based on our giftedness. In Matthew chapter 4, 19, as I've mentioned earlier, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You're starting to realize that you're doing things beyond yourself. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 11, it says, and he gave the, uh, to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. As someone is growing in the faith, they're now being equipped to do the work that God's called us to do. Make disciples. You don't hire a pastor. You don't hire staff so that they would reach the world for Christ. No, you hire them to equip you so that we all do it together. This is multiplication. This is how the church always worked. Peter preached and thousands got saved, but then they had home-to-home -home churches and, and, and were telling everybody in their home church uh, what to do and how to live it out. And then they were spread out all over uh, the, the area and sharing the faith. The greatest uh, first missionaries ever outside of the area were non-disciples, or, or I should say non-apostles. It was the disciples that were spread out before the apostles were sent out. And they, as they went out, they spread uh, the gospel. This is where you're getting to the meat of the word. And what does a, a person sitting in this chair need? Maybe this is where you are. What you need is to know your spiritual gift. You need service opportunities. And you need to learn how to share the gospel. So that wherever you are, you know your giftedness. You know what you can do well, what you can't do well. You have opportunities to plug in. And then you're communicating the gospel wherever you are. This is where people need to grow up. This is what somebody said years ago. I was at a conference and, and they were doing study of churches. They said, if, you're, if, if things are not growing in your church, if, if a lot of the church is all about, you know, the music's not like I want. I wish we had it at this time and that time. I wish we would do this. Why don't more people do things for me? You know, I really wasn't fed in this service. You hear a lot of that. He says, you have a lot of people who are still sitting in this chair no matter how long they've been saved. And what you need to do is help people grow up, be built up. I will build my church individually and corporately that you're going to help them move beyond just being fed to start being servant, servers, equipped workers. Obviously, it gets a little smaller the longer we go, but that was never God's desire. Every believer is called to grow from an unbeliever to a child to a growing worker. Learn what your spiritual gift is, and we're going to give you opportunities for that. We're going to make sure we're very clear about the opportunities of serving inside the church, outside these walls, and how to share the gospel. I'll have something very early in the year about different methods of sharing the gospel, that you don't have to memorize 85 verses and, and, and 14 paragraphs, that we will get it very simple so that no matter where you are, how do you transition a conversation from normal everyday stuff to the gospel of hope? And it's not awkward. It's not a sales approach. It's just simply breathing out, living out the very gospel you believe. The last one is my favorite one because this is where my goal is for every one of us. The rocking chair that I bought to put on my front porch because Jennifer's always wanted a rocking uh, chair on her front porch. We never had one. I was going to bring my lazy boy. Because it is a great chair, but hard to move. The reason I have a lazy boy is because when Jennifer was pregnant with our firstborn, Nehemiah Jordan, didn't know he'd be Nehemiah at that time, but I was going to have a baby. I said, I want a lazy boy where I can rock my baby when he's born. I can't nurse that baby. I don't know how to change diapers. I guess maybe I'll learn. But one thing I love is when you can hold a baby and rock them. You know the difference between someone who sits in this chair and sits in this chair? They've reproduced. They've led someone to Christ and they're shepherding them and rocking them and helping them to grow. We are all called to become parents, grandparents, if you will, in the ministry. Sometimes it's not people we've personally led to Christ, but we are helping people to grow in the way that we sometimes we just kind of adopt people. They came to faith, but they were abandoned, orphaned as a new believer. And we can come alongside and say, come sit on my lap, you know, small child. Let me help you grow. Let me love you. Let me uh, help you be assured that, that God is in control and this will all work out. Let me tell you some stories of my faith. That's what, what parents and grandparents do to younger believers. And that if we're growing in faith, going from a non-believer to an infant believer to, to a working believer, we get to the point where 
we're actually investing back in and helping others to grow up in the faith. This is the multiplication effect that I'm desiring for every one of us to grow to. Now, sometimes we, we kind of revert back. Maybe, maybe we're in a position of feeding and growing, but sometimes we need to sit back and go, let me just grow or let me be served for a little bit because I'm in a, a unique you know, transition period of my life. But realize that in your own evaluation of your life, where are you in your Christian life? Who is actually needing you to invest in them and to love them and to help them grow? I don't care if you've you've been saved only five months or you've been saved 50 years. You have something more than the person down the row here, and you can help. That we need to continue to grow up and help others to grow. What does it say in the scriptures? In John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Throughout John chapter 15, we looked at last week, there is bearing fruit, there's bearing much fruit, and there's bearing more fruit. As the verses read earlier this morning, 2 Timothy 2.2, what does Paul say to young Timothy? What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. There's four generations there. Paul heard it from somebody. He gave it to someone else, and they're going to continue to pass it on. This is a great position to be in as a believer. I mentioned last week about addition versus multiplication. You know, the average church that's growing, and most churches are not growing at all across the United States, but the average church that's growing and seeing some, some, uh, some success is growing about 10% a year. So if you have 100 people, uh, you know, you've added 10 people by the end of the year. In 10 years, you'll have about 260 people from that originally 100-person uh, church. A multiplication effect is completely different. If only 50 people were added... Of course, that's more than 10. But if, if, if you have 100 people in a church and only half decide to reach someone for Christ and see them come to faith, and they do, then you have 150, right? And then you spend the next two years just mentoring those 50 that have reached the 50. And in the third year, and you do it again where only half reaches it, and then, you know, spend two years, and then, uh, then only half of those reach the next generation and go on. Just reaching half and mentoring them and modeling them and helping them grow up to become a parent, by the 10th year, you have a, over 1,100 people that are involved. You see the difference? Adding 10 people a year because they just happen to move in the neighborhood. Maybe they're contributing some. But when at least half of, 50, or half of 100 people, 50 people begin to reach and, and, and disciple those, and then you spend two full years... Not that you have to wait that long, but I'm just talking for for math purposes. You're only spending half that time. In 10 years, you've got over 1,000 people because they're not just sharing the gospel. They're actually helping people to grow up in the faith and teaching them how to do it themselves, fishers of men. Here's the four points in case I missed them on the screen. What are we to do in the method of, of growth? With the relationships and opportunities we have, we need to engage the spiritually lost, We need to establish the new believer. We need to equip the growing worker. And we need to empower the multiplying disciple maker. Empower them, release them to do everything that that God's called them to do. This is the method Jesus used. Jesus said, come and see. Jesus said, uh, follow me. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of people. And he also said for us to bear much fruit. That's what we're to call to do. Now, there's three, three ways that I would like some help immediately. Three things that you can do. This is the application of the day. If you're more in the, the worker position or you're in the parent position, the reproducing position, I, I need you to consider one of three things that I need from you. If you're in, a, a, in more of a child position, uh, let me know what you need, and I want to help you grow. All right, and we're going to start establishing different opportunities for all three of these uh, positions. But here's what I need. One of three things. I need uh, people to be on a prayer team for me. People who are willing to pray with me, pray for me, and pray for the evangelistic efforts of our church. 
Now, we have a prayer gathering on Wednesday night that we may be moving to Wednesday afternoon at noontime for those who uh, are retired, can't get out at night, and those business people who'd like to be a part. Um, but this is beyond that. It's specifically praying uh, just for a few minutes on a Sunday morning. And other times when we have new believers that we're connected with, I want you to know their names and pray for them. When we start collecting the ones, the names and people's hearts here, and we li we're going to li list a whole list of people. Who's your one? I want to know every one of those ones. And I want people who are committed to pray through every name consistently, weekly. So I want people to be a part of a prayer team. I want people to be a part of the street team, as it's already been established, that we're going to do some specific things coming up where we're going to get out, we're going to knock on some doors, we'll figure out what the, the, the protocol needs to be in COVID, but we want to make sure that we're do, go, doing as much work outside these walls as we're doing inside these walls, and I want people who are willing to be a part of that. And the third team I'm asking for help right now is what I'm going to call the Next Steps Ministry Team. Where are people and what is their next step? After the service, Jennifer and I have been going into the parlor, which has been, you know, working fine. But sometimes I, I, I get caught up with somebody who needs a little more attention, and I'm missing a lot of people. I need people who are willing to uh, be with us in, that, in that, that time period, who are willing to engage people wherever they are in their life. Maybe they're a brand new, or maybe not a believer at all. They want more information about the gospel. Maybe they're saying, hey, I'm thinking about joining the church. Maybe they're saying, you know, I'm kind of, I need to grow. I just don't know what to do now. Hey, I want to serve. You know, wherever they are, that they can go to that room and they're going to find somebody who's helpful, that they will know what the next step is for that individual and will help them get there. Maybe five to seven people a week who can help me be on the next step uh, ministry team. Some of it may be just prayer. Someone's breaking down on the surface and they just really need someone to encourage them. And in that room, they come. My next step is just to be prayed for. And I need some people who can be a part of that on a rotation basis. You don't have to be in there every week. But, if you, but that, that's part of it, that this team would exist. I wrote down, exist to help each person take their next step on the disciple-making pathway to live out their full redemptive potential. If you're willing to be on one of those three teams... Uh, you can use the red card to write it down. Hey, I want to be on your street team. I want to be on the prayer team. I want to be on the next steps team. Or it, perhaps you're sitting and going, I don't know what I need to do, but I, I'm, I, I need some help to know. Write that down and hand that to me before you leave today. Or email me at cjordan at wlbc.org. I really want us to be engaged and grow together. I'm going to leave these chairs up here, but I'll ask that you not come sit down and get comfortable. But I want us to pray together and then prepare uh, to conclude our service today. It's often been said, is the service over? And I'm just going to, you know, uh, uh, let you know what I think about that. I don't think the service is over. The service is just about to begin. Here we worship in a gathering. There is where we serve. And so when you leave this place, have a heart of service. How are you going to lead as a servant? Let me pray for us as the music team prepares. Father, thank you for today that we could gather in this room, love one another, uh, encourage one another both through song, through prayer, through teaching, uh, through greeting each other in the hallway, through smiles, through waves, whatever it is that, that we're able to do with one another. I'm thankful that we that have that privilege. But I'm thankful that you didn't just call us to salvation and you didn't just call us to be a part of some holy huddle called the church. You've called us to equip us, to establish us in the faith, equip us in the ministry, and to multiply that we would be empowered by the Spirit to take your message to the ends of the earth. Every single believer that you've called to yourself, you have transformed and are preparing to send on mission, whether it's across the street or around the world. Father, I pray we would be obedient. The, the scriptures say that, that if we love you, we'll obey what you command us. And you have commanded us to go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching others to obey all that you've commanded. We can't teach others to obey until we're willing to obey. So, Father, today I pray that we would all uh, step it up. We take the next step of our full redemptive potential to whatever you want us to do, let us be children of God who are growing up to be representatives and servants of you. You do your work in the life of every individual here and those at home. 
but you truly will do your work in the life of all of us collectively as the body of Christ lives out what you desire of us. I pray for that 920 people and beyond that you're going to call us to reach. Let us be effective in that for your glory and for our joy. As we have this hymn of invitation, Father, I pray that you do the work in the hearts of every person. If someone is someone who's not on the, the, the right side of faith, they don't believe or they're not following you at this moment, may they feel your call, your love, and repent and receive you. And for the baby Christians here who, who maybe have been uh, dabbling in some things, perhaps they've got their one-year-old birthday cake and they're just making a mess of it and putting it all over their face, I pray you'd call them to maturity to grow up and begin to serve you in greater ways and help us all to have the privilege of reproducing to lead people to Christ and help them to grow up in the faith until they have their own uh, reproduction, which is a joy. Father, thank you for today. Bless all those who are, are here and online. Give us a wonderful thanksgiving, but let us obey and love you in the right way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.